Welcome back everyone, Mike McConville here one more time for String Tech. We've got a few things on the go today, but I wanted to talk about these feeler gauges. I picked these up at the surplus store for two, three bucks, right? Usually pick up a few at a time. Now, I like the ones that you can actually disassemble, and I'll explain that in a second. I just want this 7 thou feeler gauge. Let me explain. Well, I snipped that to size with my 10 snips, and taped it into place with this very thin scotch tape. So this, I'm making this undercut that I make. Ooh, that 7 thou might be a little thick. We'll have to go thinner than that. Let's see how this works. Ah, much better. Okay. Slip that in a little further. Finish up the last little bit. I'm staying away from that outside edge and you can see I'm angling the saw so that we get the inside. And the whole idea of course is to as I keep saying, cover our tracks. So that's a two thou feeler gauge that uh, I've got taped on there now. And this is going to give us that little tiny bit of flex that we need after we reset the neck. And that's going to do it. I got a couple of maneuvers I want to show you guys, especially you, you know, the latest uh, GPS tech deck guys. So we're going to go over to the tech deck for a second. Just to make sure I don't dig into the wood, I rake that glue off, hold the chisel out of a 70 degree angle, just off 90.
I'm quite happy with how that cleaned up. Now we'll let the dance begin and we'll tilt that neck back a little bit at a time until we get the right angle. Well, I have been socking the humidity to this guitar for the last three or four weeks and I'm delighted with the results. That this was really dishing in uh, before I started. Now this is a very lightly braced guitar and we are not going to put medium strings on it, that's for sure. But I'll try just a regular light string and I may even go with custom lights. We'll just see how the guitar responds acoustically and more importantly structurally. As you can see I've rotated the body of this Martin D41 on the body platform to give me access to the footprint of the soundboard that needs to be cleaned up before we re-glue the neck. So I'm isolating that footprint. I go just past the lacquer line a little bit. So as I sand, that way nothing will creep beyond the confines of the fingerboard extension onto the soundboard. In other words, we're covering our tracks. Like you've heard me say countless times, if you do it right, upon completion, it should be as close to undetectable as possible. Once again, I've got a tongue depressor with two-sided tape. You do not want to use your finger or you will not get a flat surface. You'll dig a hole if you just use your finger and sandpaper. This way, we keep that mating surface dead flat. just kind of roughing up this surface here. We've got a bunch of different materials converging pearl and plastic and wood. I don't want to alter it. I'm just kind of scratching the surface a little bit to help get a mechanical adhesion with the, uh, with the glue. And we are ready now to start working on this neck angle. This is where it gets tricky and it's a bit of a balancing act. Several things need to be taken into consideration than just setting the neck back. We have that fall off where the neck meets the body. In a perfect world you want to put that straight edge up there and it should just kiss the bridge. I'm happy with what we've got. You gotta remember we will be refretting and we will likely go with a little bit higher fret than what's in there. I had recently sort of bantered back and forth with one of my subscribers uh, who mentioned this whole thing about uh, correcting the fingerboard and playing with the size of the fret and oh. now I've never used a uh, what's it called a doctor some bridge doctor you know I don't really subscribe to that and I guess a lot of people do but my issue with that and my issue with this guitar in particular it's a beautiful sounding D41 Martin very lightly built very light braces I do not want to add any mass or extra tension to the soundboard. I want it to remain a beautiful sounding guitar. It's not just about the neck angle and making it play its optimum, but you don't want to change the sound of this beautiful guitar. We're left with a lot of things to consider. Ultimately, you want to have the action so it's, it's beautiful to play, and of course you want it to play perfectly in tune. You do not want to alter the original sound of this guitar, the reason that the customer bought it in the first place. So it's a dance between frets, fingerboard trajectory, and neck angle. And the idea is to bring all of these components together to get the ultimate match. Perfect intonation, perfect playability, and a wonderful sounding guitar.
And now that we've got the guitar to this stage, I'm ready to pull the frets, correct the fingerboard, and as I have shown in past videos, we will use our pilot frets, 3rd fret and 11th fret, to get the perfect neck angle and the right amount of fingerboard correction to reduce that proverbial hump at the neck to body junction and the right height at the soundboard and bridge. As you can see, I've got my pilot frets in there, and we're going to check that measurement later. But I just wanted to give you an overall tutorial on how I use a GPS tech deck to kind of hone in on the perfect neck angle. Because As everyone knows who's done this type of work, the neck has to be right this way and this way, and that is what we're lining up here. And I'll bring you in for a closer look in a second. 
It also has to be right this way and this way. The main reason we took the neck off was to reduce the action and those two planes are what can be adjusted to bring the strings down for optimum height. And I will also explain that in more detail in a second. And this gives you yet another perspective on how I set up to do the neck reset. So as I put that straight edge on there, these are my pilot frets, the third and in this case the twelfth. So I put my straight edge on there and I slip up to the bridge. This is the treble side. And this is the bass side. And now that we've got all of those various angles verified this is dry run nothing's glued on yet including the bridge that's just held on with those fasteners so these two pieces of masking tape serve as the guidelines for the fingerboard extension and the neck to body angle this ruler lines up those double lines dead center between the two middle strings This is a leather bag filled with buckshot and it supports the guitar across the head block underneath. I'll bring in for a closer look. Gryffindor! I know it looks like the sorting hat from Harry Potter, but this is what we've got. So it's filled with lead buckshot. So I just use that funnel and fill this up to the optimum level so that when I put it on the Tech Dex body platform, it's not too high, but it's just high enough to support the underside of the acoustic guitar back across the head block. This is the ledge that that buckshot bag sits on, and this is the spring clip for the end of the fingerboard extension to hold it down tight. And there is a tongue depressor under there to make sure that we don't mar the underside of the soundboard. Now that all that geometry has been uh, covered, we can pop the neck off and start adjusting it. Yeah, so all these little strips of sandpaper are cut up in advance. There's our guidelines for the fingerboard extension. I have my straight edge with me here that I will use to actually check the pitch. So this neck angle is very close to being finished. One stroke on each side to make sure you keep that, th that you keep this whole thing aligned side to side. Turn it around to check it again on the face. Make sure that we haven't gone off. Oh, that's looking pretty good. So I'm checking that angle with my pilot frets. Yeah, that's very happy with that. So we're ready to put our shims in. And I want to talk a little bit about this. If I pull the neck up like this, it's only loose here. It's not loose here. So you don't need full length shims, you really just need those shims, that first two inches or so. Let's talk a little bit more about that. You can see the cutter slip there at the Martin factory. That's okay, you're the only people to ever see that. So that is the placement and shape of the Koa shims that I'm about to glue into place.
This pencil line represents the ledge that you want left over after we finish finessing this to get this to fit properly. I got a beautiful dry press fit on that dovetail. I've set the guitar up again, removed that 12 fret, did that little bit of correction at the neck to body junction, and now we're going to proceed to put the frets in the fingerboard extension. This, this is the bean bag filled with buckshot. By supporting the guitar at the head block, that keeps the dovetail in place as I'm doing that last bit of leveling. So this is how I set up for driving those frets and the fingerboard extension. I've got my bench dog hockey puck there holding that down tight to the maple block. And that maple block is supported by that chunk of steel which bridges across the two rails of the body platform. So here's a close-up of that bridge re-glue on the back side here. And this is the front side. Now in this case, after the neck reset, this saddle is cantilevered back slightly towards the pins. The other option was to fill in the slot and re-slot. But I thought I'd get away with uh, this bone saddle cantilevering back ever so slightly. It's really only for the low E and the A string. The other four strings fall within the confines of that slot. And there's the compensated nut for 12 to 53 at concert pitch. A lot of that dishing in of the top between the bridge and the edge of the sound hole has been corrected by two things. 
I had humidified this guitar for a good two weeks before I started working on it. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is the 24-foot spherical radius of the bridge, when the bridge was glued on, it actually corrected that imploding top even more by lifting it up a little bit straighter. Got a good healthy string height off the soundboard here, enough to drive that soundboard, but not too much tension that would cause damage. Lots of real estate now in that saddle now that that neck has been reset. And although this guitar is a bunch of little nicks and bashes and war wounds, I guess, from over the years, it is in remarkably good shape. No braces have let go, no cracks that had to be dealt with. Top and back are pretty clean. Let's go have a listen. 